I heard this morning while I was at Trinity a story that I think is cautionary for all of us. We often take things for granted. The most significant thing we take for granted is time. Pastor King related to his congregation that the husband of one of their members had passed away yesterday. It seems that they, the couple was at a funeral and, and they were discussing the events of the funeral and the husband started remarking to his wife that he would like this and that at his own home going. And as we would do, we'd say, all right, let's talk about that some other time. They left the funeral and went to the repast. She was in line at the repast and he came walking towards her and fell dead. Time is not promised to us. We take too much for granted. That's just the way it is. And certainly you don't want your life to be the example for somebody else. But that's just the way it is sometimes. And guess what, church? At some point, we're all going to leave here. Amen. The question is, will you be prepared for the next place you'll go? I believe if you accept Jesus on this side, you've already started your heaven journey. And so it's just a transition from this place. But make no mistake about it now, at some point in the future, every person sitting in this room will have died. If we're here long, every single person, be mindful of that as you make your decisions. Time is not promised to any of us. Pray for that family. She was a member of their praise team. How many of y'all know that you can stand up and praise on Friday? And then something can come and try to affect your praise on Saturday. That's, that's just how life is. And so I thought I'd come today. That's a hard way to get into this. But I just want to remind you that you ought to take every opportunity to thank God for what he's done for you. Every opportunity. And don't, 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 don't say, well, I'm going to get it together. And then next Sunday, I'm going to be ready with my full-throated praise. Man, you, we need your full-throated praise this day. We, we don't need you holding anything in reserve. You need to give God all, all you got today. And so that brings me to our, our message today. I've been in a sermon series on stewardship. And I guess I don't think I'm deviating today. It's just not per se uh, a stewardship message unless you consider that you have to be responsible for stewardship of your praises. All right. All right. And so today I want to pull from a familiar passage of scripture for some. This 17th chapter of Luke. There are a few verses there starting at verse 11 that I think will lay a solid foundation for our message today. While you're looking for that, let me just make sure you understand that Thursday's celebration is a national celebration, all right? It's a national celebration by our country. It is not per se a spiritual celebration, which means you can celebrate Thanksgiving and not give God praise. I don't know who you're going to thank, but it's a national celebration. Some people celebrate Thanksgiving, but they don't give God glory for what has been done. They just know it's Thanksgiving Day. And I'm here to tell you right now, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and if you know the Lord started it all and makes it all possible, then your celebration of Thanksgiving has to have as a foundation a spiritual component. You must thank the maker and creator for everything. If you're a Christian, you need to sign that in Jesus' name. Uh, that's important now. All right, the colonists, after they completed the first harvest, 
they had enough sense to turn around and realize that they didn't make it rain. They also realized that they didn't make the food grow. And so they thanked the Lord, well, they thanked God for what had happened. And so from that time to this time, there have been various expressions of gratitude. But it wasn't until 1863 that our country started giving it national recognition. And that's when Abraham Lincoln, who we know from history, was a praying man, decided that he was going to set aside and appoint a day of Thanksgiving, and he issued the first Thanksgiving Day proclamation. And he designated the fourth or last Thursday of November as a holiday. That's why Thanksgiving floats from time to time. It's either the fourth or the last thank, uh, Thursday in Thanksgiving that constitutes the celebration of the day. But doesn't it put us in a Thanksgiving, in an in a, in a attitude of gratitude when we get around this time? Yeah, you ought, to, you ought to start counting your blessings. It's infused our country so much. When I heard the announcements today, well, when I heard the announcements this week when they were sent to me, when Greg sent them to me, I immediately recognized uh, an indicator of my adolescence when he sent them. I don't know if you heard it in the announcement, the underlying music was from Peanuts. Yeah, and it's the celebration, the Thanksgiving celebration from Peanuts, and I knew all the time it's holiday time because they're playing the Peanuts cartoon on TV. There are certain things that should give you an indicator that you ought to be grateful for something. But you ought to be mature enough to get up and look in the morning at your hand. You don't need to hear no music. The fact that you can open your eyes and see your hand, Casanova ought to tell you, I ought to, I ought to be thankful today. The fact that you can breathe I ought to tell you you ought to be thankful. And so this passage of scripture identifies a situation that I believe will give us some indication of how we should continue to praise the Lord. Luke chapter 17 verse 11 reads, and it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar, afar off. And they, the lepers, lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that, you ought to underline this, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. I'm going to read that verse 15 again. It said, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And then Luke added as an editorial, and he was a Samaritan. Wow. Now that's crucial. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? They are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. This passage of scripture, that's, that ends the reading of the passage of scripture that I want to give you. Uh, I, I want to use, if I have to, as a central thought today, this subject. This is a good place for a praise break. <laughs> All right, this is a good place for a praise break. Right here. So I started thinking about this concept of gratitude. And it came to mind, sadly, that not everybody is grateful. People can do for you stuff that you never could have done for yourself. Never could have imagined, never could have mustered up enough 
to put all the resources together. And yet, when that's done, people don't even have enough about them to turn around and say thank you. I bet if I ask by a show of hands, everybody in here will say, I was raised in the house. You better say thank you if somebody did something for you. My mama would have broke my back if I didn't say thank you after she gave me a popsicle or, or something. I was raised to say thank you. And somehow between adolescence and adulthood, that seemed to burn off on some folk. In fact, some people think you're supposed to do something to help them. Uh, how many of y'all know that not everybody that leaves the hospital thanks heaven for it? No, 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 no. Not everybody that gets out of jail says thank you, Jesus. Although I found that a lot of them find Jesus in jail. <sighs> found that to be the case. Yeah, oh, Jesus down there on D block. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, after they get out, they leave Jesus on D block. Not everyone who finds love thanks the Lord for finding love. In fact, some people just drift and, and float and, and, and they receive blessing after blessing. It's obvious. You can look at their life and know that God is flooding them with all kinds of blessing. They have grace in their lives and they receive it and don't know how to properly give a thanks for it. They, they, they might think it's medicine, but how many of y'all know that it's mercy? They think, it's, they think it's medicine, but, but, but it's mercy. I, I, I've had medicine before, and I had to pray for the medicine to work. Lord, help me. You know, the, I took it. Been long enough for it to be in my system, but the pain still on me. And then I say, Lord, help me. And it seemed like there's a turbo infusion of grace, and that medicine suddenly kicks in, in, in place. I, I don't know if there's something... Uh, you know, heaven's got better than pharmacology, and I know that people without medicine can feel better. I know that, but it's interesting. I believe it's mercy that helps me. Some folk might think it's the doctor, but you know, and I know that it's really divine what's going on. Some folk might think it's their job that's blessing them, that's allowing them to get this turkey or whatever they're going to get, turkey pot pie, but it's really Jehovah. Who's making it possible? In fact, some folk will even ascribe it, Richard, to luck. But it ain't luck, it's love. That's allowing things to happen. In fact, they, they may think it just happened. Stuff just, just happened. But it ain't just happening, it's holy. And some folk might even think it's just coincidence. But I'm here to tell you, I believe it's not coincidence, it's divine providence that allows things to happen. And this passage of scripture is a wonderful example of how we look at it. See, the first thing we get to in this, tra in this chapter and in this verse is somebody's in trouble. There's a whole a lot of trouble going on because Jesus is, first of all, traveling in a place that Jews shouldn't be in the first place. Samaria was a place that Jews didn't travel through because Jews and, 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 and Samaritans didn't get along. They were historic enemies. And yet Jesus finds himself traveling through Samaria and Galilee. We used to sing a song when I was growing up, saying, I know a man from, from Galilee. Anybody else sing that song? I know a man from Galilee. Yes, I do. That's <laughs> what we used to say. Uh, he picked me up, turned me around, placed my feet on. Somebody else was in choir rehearsal with me. But I know a man from Galilee, yes I do. He saved me, yeah. But as they enter the village, the village he's not supposed to be into, how many of you know that I'm glad Jesus go places that we say he shouldn't go to? Cause we go places we shouldn't go to. And I'm glad that cause we go to places we shouldn't, Jesus is not foreign to those places. Cause I've been places I would have been shamed for my mama to know I was there. And yet Jesus kept me while I was there. He let me get out of them places. Yeah, I went to one of them Q parties one time. Casanova. That's what they said, don't go Andre. Don't go Andre, I was hard headed. Mason, I went in there anyway, and thank God I made it out. <laughs> I 
No, we, we go places that, believe me, ain't, nothing, ain't no different than a Q party and an alpha party and a sigma. Well, I don't know about the sigmas. I don't know about <laughs> I don't know. Sigmas might be different, though, for real. <coughs> you were there. <laughs> I saw you. <laughs> yeah. She was at Tuskegee with me down there, jumping around. She saw me over there in the corner. Um, <laughs> He runs into trouble, and the trouble he runs into is a whole hospital war standing outside. A whole hospital war of people who are sick. They had leprosy. And if you had leprosy during this time, you were in trouble. Because not only is, was leprosy a physical disease, not only did you have a biological problem, more significantly at that time, if you had leprosy, you had a social and a religious problem. You couldn't be around folk if you had leprosy. Not, 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 not just the fact that what's going on in your body is tearing you up. Not just the fact that this disease is so debilitating you that you can't work. That you have things that are going on with different parts of your body atrophy and, and sometimes in some instances if it got so bad you would have toes falling just different things happening to you these folks were in trouble and they're standing outside it's, it's no wonder that as he's going into the village he runs into them because they were not allowed to go in the village they had to stand outside and not only did they have to stand outside the law required that they announce themselves just so nobody would come in touch with them. They were social pariahs, and they were sick. Come on now, sick is hard anyway. But can you imagine sick and your mama can't visit you? Can you imagine sick and your husband can't come soothe you just a little bit, can't do anything for you? Because they were so afraid of the disease, they thought if husband brought you a bowl of soup, what you had would jump on husband, and then husband would come back to the village, and everybody would be affected or afflicted. And so what they do is put you outside. In fact, it was so bad, they made them live out by the graveyard, by the junkyard. That's how they had to live, and they had to figure out how to eat and how to take care of themselves. Now, don't, don't look at them like they were so bad back then, because we do the same thing now. We, we got folk in our community who are sick that we treat as social outcasts. Yeah, I told you before, there was a man who lived downtown who I called a ghost. I would pass him on the street. He was homeless, notoriously homeless. And he just looked like a mass of man, clothing, bedraggled, and people would give him a wide berth on the street. No one would ever come into contact with him. It's just as if he moved around at will and he never had any human contact. For all practical purposes, he had social leprosy. Nobody would deal with him. Nobody that I could see stopped him and asked him if he was hungry or if he needed some food. Nobody would stop him and ask him if he was hurting. Nobody would ask him. He was covered like this in the summer. He was covered like this in the winter. It didn't matter what the temperature was. Everything he owned was on him. He was a social outcast. So don't think that just because times have passed, folk don't have leprosy now. We just don't call it leprosy. We call it drug addiction. We call it alcoholism. We call it anything that's not like you. We have made being homeless almost criminal. We certainly have made it a social outcast. How can we have the love of God in us and know that there are people who we are required to take care of and we treat them as if they are nothing? We make laws saying that they can't be in a certain place because they are homeless. We say they can't sit in the park during the day because it affects tourism. It's a park in the city they live in. Why? Because they don't have an address? 
Oh, 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 no, no. See, the, 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 the Paul that's come over the room right now is what should have been happening back in Jesus' day. But that's not the case because they were insensitive. It took a man coming through. A man that nobody gave any thought to. He had to come through and tell them that the social norms you have right now are wrong. You can't treat people like this. You got to take care of folk. And so he runs into a hospital ward full of people. And they're out there, they're crying. I can't imagine when they bathed. I can't imagine when they had any of the hygiene that they needed to take care of. I, can't ima I can imagine that every one of them was malnourished. That was probably moaning. Can you imagine the sound, the smell, the misery that was going on there? And that's what Jesus walked into. Now, you might sit in this nice, pretty congregation today and not think that's a problem. But for Jesus walking through Samaria that day, they were in trouble. They were in trouble. And if it had been one of your relatives, you would know that they were in trouble. Leprosy wasn't new in the Bible. We, we, we could go through Old Testament into the New Testament and see individuals who had leprosy. And I can tell you, it didn't matter if you were the gardener or a general. If you had leprosy, you got a problem. You had to get it fixed. And guess who the responsible person for fixing things was? The priest. Now, I find that mighty ironic that the one who knew the scrolls, the one who knew prophecy, who knew the scripture, the one who knew about the coming of Jesus Christ still treated folk like they were nothing. These are the same folk who were tithing, who were doing everything, giving offering. There was no offering for leprosy. There was just outcast for leprosy. These folk are sitting there and they are about out of hope. Can't you see them, Casanova, trailing along the fence? They're in trouble. But folk who are in trouble are desperate. And they're looking for somebody to help them out. And I can imagine that they trailed along the fence line or the rock line listening to folk. And it's a good thing that folk who get blessed by the Lord every now and then talk about them. See, you can't keep your blessings to yourself. You, 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 gotta, you gotta tell somebody how good God is, Denise. When you're walking along, you might just be on your way to, uh, to lunch, but you ought to be telling somebody, you know, God's been good to me today. Yeah, you, you ought to be having that testimony with somebody. You shouldn't be swallowing that because somebody who's in trouble just might be listening to you. They might need to know how you got out of the trouble that you find yourself in. You got to tell somebody that God's been good to you. And I see that this hospital full of folk who are in trouble reach a turning point. And the turning point that they reach is somebody heard about a man named Jesus. I don't know how they knew who he was. I don't know if somebody said he wears a red tunic. I don't know if they said he's got on blue sandals when he comes in. All I know is when you are desperate and when you're in trouble, you're looking and scanning the horizon. You want some relief from your problem. And when they were standing outside that village that day, they saw a turning point in their situation and he came walking through. And the Bible says it very clearly that as he came walking up outside this certain village, they lifted up their voices. How did they know, Karen? How did they know who to start hollering? Maybe it was the fact that he was traveling with a whole group of folk, that it was 12 folk. Maybe that's how he knew. But anyway, in their desperation, these folk who are only supposed to announce, I have leprosy, or wear a bell to let folk know, who are not supposed to have any contact with anybody, but they were desperate. They were desperate. And they see a rabbi coming in, because Jesus was a rabbi. And they take, literally, Shelby, they take their life in their own hand because they start screaming at a rabbi coming down. Do you know that they could be killed? But when you're desperate, oh, yeah. nothing's going to stop you from, from doing what you need to do uh, to get better. The Bible says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Who knew that joy was going to come walking in the village? Joy came walking in the village. They, 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 they know that they'd heard about a man who's been going around the countryside. Now, Jesus' whole ministry never extended beyond three square miles from where he was born the whole time he was there. He was walking everywhere. But they heard about a man who had been going around 
the countryside healing folk. They heard about a man who had been teaching, and he was teaching so boldly that he was dumbfounded the scribes and the Pharisees. They heard about this man who had been teaching fishermen how to fish when they couldn't catch fish. They heard about this man who was rumored to have already healed a leopard. Now, that'll get, get your attention. If you got leprosy and you heard, because you know we'll do something on I heard. Oh, I heard to get you up. I heard, I heard, I heard. You remember when they used to give cheese away? Government cheese. All you had to do was heard about it. I heard they give them cheese. Everybody in the world had cheese in their freezer. That was some good cheese. That was some good cheese. You'll get in trouble over that cheese. Don't you cut my block of cheese. What you doing here making sandwiches out of this cheese? That's what macaroni and cheese. Yeah, everybody going around at Thanksgiving trying to get blocks of cheese from everybody. Why don't they still make that cheese somewhere there? The same Jesus who has stopped, they say, stopped at a funeral procession and it turned into a party. The same Jesus. There's something about this man that means that if we can just get next to him, the same Jesus who healed a leper, who taught fishermen how to fish, who turned a funeral procession into a party, who they say had healed a centurion's son, had raised Jairus' daughter, had healed a woman with the issue of blood, had fed a multitude of people with a lunchable. The same Jesus who had cast out demons. I believe if we can just get to this man, he can help us out. And the Bible says that this very Jesus that they had heard about, the one that somebody had been talking about, the one who in an offhanded remark had said, I was at lunch today and I saw Jesus. Tell somebody that. Jesus came my way. Jesus helped me. Jesus helped me get a job. Jesus helped my arthritis go away. Jesus, let Jesus be in your mouth because somebody needs to hear Jesus because they're in trouble. And if they can hear about this Jesus, then just maybe like these lepers, they can reach a turning point in, in, in their life. They said to him, Master, Master. They didn't even say, heal me. They just said, have mercy. Y'all don't know the power of Jesus' mercy. Mercy can cover anything. Just have mercy. You can have a physical problem and mercy can wipe it out. Yeah, yeah, you can have a mental problem and mercy can make it all better. Mercy from Jesus can straighten things out. They lifted up their voices and they called to him and, 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 and they knew that if Jesus just gave them mercy, everything would be all right. It was their turning point. But, but, but then something happened, Richard, and I'm mighty ashamed of this. Even all this time later, I'm ashamed that Jesus stopped by his stopped in his tracks to help somebody. You ever stopped and helped somebody and they were ungrateful? Stop, stop what you were doing. Stop what you were doing now. Went, went, out, went, went off your way. Came back. Helped them. And they were, they were ungrateful. The Bible says, the scripture says that Jesus healed them. And it's amazing what he said. He said, go show yourself to the folk who have to verify that what I've done is a blessing. Now that's what he said. He said, I, I don't want poo poo them to tell. You go tell the priest. Because when the priest sees that you have a bona fide healing, he has to declare you not just. See, y'all see, y'all think they just want to be healed physically. No, no, it doesn't matter because, see, I know y'all. I know some folk who stopped drinking 20 years ago and y'all still call him a drunk. Well, you know he got a drinking problem. But he hadn't had a drink in 20 years. I mean, that's because we remember. We won't let folk get over what they went through. We call folk who've been clean, off drugs, most of their lives, but if they had a problem when they were young, we, gotta, we might get in the corner and whisper it, but we'll say, you know, he's doing all right now, but uh, yeah. 
but he had a drug problem. Yeah, he raised a whole family because we won't let folk. It have to let, it, we have to get the approval from somebody in authority. And so it seems to me that it's appropriate that the church be the place to validate when folk have truly been healed and come around. Unfortunately, Ingrid, I found that it's the church that keeps the mess up. In a place where folk are supposed to be healed, folk are supposed to be released from their backgrounds, we perpetuate what folk have gone through. But that's all right. Folk can say what they want to say. All right? In this instance, these folk were about to get healed. It only required them to be, Anthony, obedient. Y'all didn't hear that. So you come in here and you come to Jesus, come to Jesus and get the word. But then you can't just get the word. You have to be obedient and go do what the word says. A whole lot of folk want to come and just get the word. But Jesus said, go show yourself. Now, suppose they said he ain't going to touch us. He's not going to lay hands on us. I can't get no prayer cloth. <laughs> Give me a prayer tunic or something, Jesus. I need, I need something. I need a card from you, Mason, saying that I've been healed. And, and that's not what happened. Jesus said, go show yourself. Now, I was clear when I said this in verse 15. Is that the one I said where he said, he said, uh, no, I'm sorry. And he said, and it came to pass in verse 14, the last part, as they went. Can you imagine? I'm standing over here. I'm bedraggled. I'm toe up from the floor. My skin has been atrophied and sunburned. But when Jesus gives the word, go, all I do is turn. And as I'm turning, as the old folk used to say, I looked at my hand. And they looked new. I looked at my feet. And they did too. As they turn, some folk, as you leave the word and go about doing what God tells you to do, there's a blessing that follows you, that's healing, that follows you if you go and do what he said. That's why it's called a, a turning, turning point from, from your trouble. They turned and they went and they were healed. You got to be obedient. Once you get the word, you got to move. You got to do something. You got to get up, get going, be what God tells you to go and be. And that's when your change is going to come. I can imagine. Can you imagine that as they were turning, they turned and suddenly their bodies started changing. They started feeling places, blood in places they hadn't felt in a long time. They started feeling invigorated. I believe this, that God's healing, Christ's healing, is so complete that it wasn't just an exterior healing. It was interior as well. So all the systems that had broken down started working too. But more importantly, the one thing that I know that wasn't left out of the healing was their voice. And yet it seems that only in one of them was there complete enough healing for him to turn around and say something back. Because one of them, ten of them, turn around and they're about to holler, but one stopped in his track. Before he could even, Denise, experience the healing, he realized, I didn't do this. Christ did this. And so he turned back to Christ. And the Bible said he was so, in fact, what I heard him say is, this is a good place for a praise break. I need to stop in my tracks. I need to turn around and say, God, you've been good to me. I need to celebrate. I need to shout. How many of y'all have taken 10 steps from your last blessing before you gave God thanks for what he'd done for you? How many of y'all waited so long? God came and gave you the deliverance that you asked for. He blessed you, and it was the next morning before you said thank you. How, how many of you didn't have an appetite for two weeks and God bless you? You ate, you slept, and you waited till you came to church on Sunday to say thank you. No, no, no. How many of you have waited? See, that's the problem when you wait. That's the problem when you don't take that moment for a praise break. I, I want to infuse this in your walk today. I want you to learn how to stop 
and praise the Lord. No matter where you are. Now that doesn't mean you have to walk pews. No, it doesn't mean you have to do side straddle hops and clap. No, it simply means you got to stop in your track. Let me tell you, can I give you a, a, a hallelujah way to praise the Lord? When he blesses you, you just dip your head and say, thank you, Lord. Oh, it's a shout. Heaven is happy when you just acknowledge how good he's been to you. You don't have to do all that old other stuff that folks say you have to do. Now, there's a time and place for all that. Every now and then, you need to get you a good case of the rips. You need to get you a good case of celebrating and let the Lord know you need to feel your hands stinging from clapping. You need to get hoarse from yelling and thanking the Lord every now and then. But that's not required every time. You can have a, a, a concert of praise by bowing your head and saying thank you to the Lord. This man went that way. He stopped. Can I tell you that Jesus notices when you don't praise him? I, I don't want to put a guilt trip on you. I, I don't. But, but I know Jesus notices when you don't praise him because he noticed in this instance. He said, did I not heal 10? Now we're talking about the same Jesus who realized that when he was in the press with a crowd, Everybody pulling in around him and one woman with an issue of blood reached down and touched the hem of his garment. He knows when virtue has gone out of him. He knows when he has blessed you. And same Jesus who knows when he's blessed you knows when you haven't turned around and blessed him back. Don't fool yourself. Don't, 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 don't say he knows my heart. Yeah, he also knows what you're not saying. He also knows what you're not doing. Learn how to take a moment and give him a praise break. Not until verse 15 that you realize that this problem has already gone on. All right? When you wait too long, your praise loses some of his energy. When you wait too long, you might not remember, Brittany, how sick you were. See, that's the problem. You know, folk in the hospital, they've been sick so long, they've been delirious. Suddenly they start getting fluids and getting to feel better. They don't even remember what happened the last five days. All they know is they feel better. They have to ask you, what day is it? Yeah, but when you wait too long to thank the Lord for how good he's been, that's what happens to you. And that's why you have to turn every immediate situation into, uh, some folks forget they were ever sick. Oh yeah, they act like they were never sick. Because see, some folks think if you put on a new suit, get up and get dressed up, that you were never in that position um, before. I love this fact too, Shelly. It's imperative that we point this out, that Jesus got praise from the one of the 10 folk who were not supposed to give him praise. See, we always throw folk away, act like they don't know. He wasn't brought up in the right neighborhood. He wasn't brought up with the right kind of upbringing. He wasn't a church-going boy. His mom and daddy didn't teach him how to praise the Lord. That's what the Samaritan was. He didn't know that there was supposed to be a Messiah. All the other ones sick like him knew he was supposed to be. A Messiah was supposed to come. And yet, when Messiah is there taking care of him and healing him, it's the nun. The non-Jew who gives him the praise. Samaritan. The black man, I'm not supposed to say that. That's political, but it's true. He was the outcast in that society. He was. And yet he's the one who's appreciative enough. Maybe it's this, maybe it's this, Robert. Maybe it's he had been so low. Maybe life had been so hard. Maybe people had been so unforgiving, so, so unyielding of him that anybody that would come along and bless him, in his opinion, was deserving of all the praise, all the glory. And so even somebody who wasn't raised in the church, I've seen it before. I've seen it before where folk come up in here, they weren't raised in church, but they praise harder than folk who've been raised in the church all their lives. I've seen it before. Where folk who didn't go to Sunday school, didn't get one of them cards from Ada, Ms. Ada every Sunday for 15 years. Yeah, we're not in Ms. Hubbard's Sunday school class. We're not in such and such Sunday school class. 
Those folk act like they get uh, praise blind. You, you know they say on, on, on TV that you can get nose blind to smells. And maybe some of y'all been blessed so much that you become praise blind. You don't realize that every day is a day of thanksgiving. You don't realize that God's been so good to you. And every day he's blessing you. You become praise blind. You don't realize that it's not given that every day you jump in that $60,000 car is supposed to crank. You don't get it. You forgot how it is to get into a $1,500 car and pray. You forgotten. Pray that when you get out there, the air still in the tires. Yeah, and that the, and, and that the battery hadn't died overnight. You forgotten because you praise blind. Yeah, you, you, you forgot when you go in there and pick through that whole two closets full of clothes. In fact, you late for work regularly because you can't figure out what to wear to work. You become praise blind. You forgot you're tired of going to this restaurant because you've been too much. You forgot what it feels like to be hungry because you become praise blind. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's this one man who had been deprived so much, he was the other side, the antithesis of praise blind. He was ne needing some praise. And so when Jesus comes through, this man who had trouble, who reached the turning point, realized that that day was Thanksgiving Day. Amen. Wasn't no pilgrims around, but it was Thanksgiving Day. <laughs> That day was Thanksgiving Day. Wasn't no Indians or anybody like that around, but it was Thanksgiving Day. Peter's wasn't playing in the background. He didn't have no soundtrack to his life other than today. Amen. It's time for me to give a praise break. Amen. Heaven is curious when you don't praise. Wow. Curious. And this man turned that day into a day of triumph. That's the last thing Luke wants us to know person when you're in trouble if you can reach a turning point my admonition to you is to turn that into a moment for a praise break and you'll be in a perfect situation to declare a victory over your situation this man had the missing link he had faith see faith is the connector don't you know that folk who don't have faith get blessings too Oh yeah, Farmer John has been sitting there every day, realizes that he can't take care of Miss Farmer and Farmer Junior and all the little piggies he got around there. He can't unless the Lord bring him some rain. Yeah. And so he gets down on his knees, Ingrid, every day, and he says, Lord, bless me. Yeah. I need you to help me, Lord. Please help me. And he prays every day while next door neighbor Farmer hadn't gotten down on his knees one day. And yet God, in his infinite mercy wanting to bless farmer brings rain down on him guess who also gets some rain next door neighbor farmer who didn't pray gets the same rain as that farmer did even though he didn't ask the Lord for it to rain one day some of y'all been getting blessed because somebody next to you has been praying and asking the Lord to bless you some of y'all been been stealing blessing some of y'all been getting blessed when you haven't even had an ounce of faith and you think it's because you're so good no it's because he's so good but you better learn that when the rain falls you better say thank you to somebody it's a good place for a, a praise break I'm going to my seat even though this sermon is hard pressed on me today because God's been good to me. God's been good to me. He, he took me to too many places, took me through too many situations there and I wasn't grateful. I wasn't. I was arrogant. I was thinking that the Lord was supposed, I was doing right. I was a good boy. I wasn't. I was thinking that he ought to bless me because I was doing right. I wasn't. Yeah, I was still in blessings, Richard. Somebody else was praying for me. I believe her name was Doris, but she was praying for me. Might have been George or Leela, but they were praying for me. How do I know? Because I wasn't praying for myself. I know it. 
I know I wasn't praying for myself. If I was, I was doing spot prayers. Yeah, that's when I get in a spot. I pray. Yeah. I wouldn't pray otherwise. Yeah. But I'm here to tell you right now that he blessed me. He, he blessed me. He kept me. He kept me, and I'm so glad he kept me till I realized that he had been keeping me the entire time. None of it was because of my foolishness. He had plans for me. He did. He did, and I want to thank him for it. I realized he sent his son Jesus for me. No one else was in the world. He sent him for me. See, see that's how you have to look at your salvation. That if you were the only one he created on, in the world, that you mattered enough that he would send his only begotten son for you, the only one in the world. And he did. He blessed me. He blessed me. And then he, he inspired after I realized that Jesus died for me. I hope you've realized that too, that Jesus came and lived for you. And then he died for you. And then Daryl, he had somebody write a song about it. I, yeah, he wrote a song about it for me, Karen. There's a song. That, that he inspired the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir to sing for me. I, I love it. He said, he said, Andre, how many times must I prove my love to you? He said, Andre, how many ways must my love for you I show? How many, how many times, Andre, do I have to rescue you from trouble for you to know how much I love you. He said, how many days must I be a fence all around you? How many nights do I have to wipe your tears away? And how many storms do I have to keep seeing you safely, safely through for you to know just how much I love you? He said, didn't I put food on your table? Didn't I show up when the bills were due? When the pains were racking your body? Didn't I send healing down to you when, when you were lost in sin and sorrow? He said, I died to set you free. Because I want you to know. I, I want you to know just how much, how much I love you. Didn't I wake you up this morning? And when I woke you up, you were clothed in your right mind. When you walked in on a problem, didn't I step right in on time? Even when you got weak, a long life's journey, I sent my angel to carry you. Why? So you would know. My question today is, do you know? Do, do you know? Do, do you know? If you know, then I suggest that this is a great place for a praise break. If you know, today is the day you ought to praise. Today is the day. Do you know? Do you know he loves you? You ought to give your heart to him. You ought to give your heart to him. Don't, don't be confused now. I'm crying, but I'm praising him. Tears are a great sign of praise. Yeah, it doesn't mean I'm sad. I know I'm saved. Doors of our church are open. Whosoever will, let them come right now. We need you. Heaven needs you. And we invite you to come right now. And join our fellowship. I promise you be a great time for a praise break when you give him your heart. Come on, choir. Grateful. I'm 
grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Because I'm grateful, grateful, so grateful just to pray. Yeah, that's the song. Flow. Yeah. Thank you.